This presentation will focus on the immunity exemplar of SLE, which is systemic lupus erythematous. SLE. SLE, which is lupus, is a chronic autoimmune disease that can damage any part of the body, including the skin, joints, and or organs within the body. It's a chronic condition because the signs and symptoms will last longer than six weeks and often for many years. People who suffer with lupus have flares when they're feeling ill and remission times when they're feeling better. Their immune system will soon sometimes become overactive. When we think about who's more at risk, it is more prevalent in women of childbearing age they are actually six to 10 times more likely to be diagnosed than their male counterparts. And typically initial diagnosis occurs between the ages of 15 and 44. African-Americans are two to three times more likely to develop lupus, lupus than their Caucasian counterparts. Patient history. So when we're thinking about patients coming into an acute facility or a primary care uh, appointment, we want to find out the symptoms. When did they start? Symptoms usually involve these 11 elements, including a malar rash, which is a rash that goes on the face, primarily across the cheeks and the bridge of the nose, a discoid rash, which is a skin condition of men multiple sores with inflammation and scarring, typically on the face, ears, and the scalp, they will complain of photosensitivity. Uh, this includes uh, artificial sunlight and natural sunlight, oral ulcers, arthritis, including osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. They can have a symptom of serositis, which is inflammation of your serous tissue within the body, typically focusing on the lungs, heart, and the abdomen. They can oftentimes develop kidney diseases, um, neurologic diseases, hematologic, immunologic disorder. You will find that these patients oftentimes will also complain of losing their hair, which is also known as alopecia. A positive ANA is seen in more than 95% of lupus patients. And a patient becomes diagnosed with lupus when they have any four of the symptoms previously listed. Thinking about health history, um, familial health history, it has been seen higher in patients who are either a multiple, such as a twin or a triplet. There is a correlation of people believing that hormones do play a part in the diagnosis and the cause of lupus, typically because of the diagnosis of it being female when their hormones are most commonly high. Assessment findings. We want to look at everything involved with the skin. We're going to start with that. So they may have rashes, plaques which typically will be seen on the scalp, face, or the neck. They may have hyperpigmentation or depigmentation, depending on the type or the phase of the disease. They may have lesions on the fingertips, elbows, toes, and surfaces of the forearms or lateral sides of the hand. They may suffer with Raynaud's disease, which is white or blue coloring of the fingers. Patients may also complain of, again, the photosensitivity, the malar rash, or discoid lupus. Generally speaking, they will complain of fatigue, a low-grade fever, arthralgia, weight changes, chronic headaches, musculoskeletal, think of arthropathy, myalgia, generalized arthritis, joint swelling, tenderness, warmth, and pain on movement, which typically will be associated with rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, 
Renal involvement can include acute or chronic renal failure or acute nephritic disease. Neurologically, the patients may have a history of seizures or psychosis. They may be suffering with behavioral changes, depressive symptoms, and anything else that we would be seeing with CNS changes. Pulmonary-wise, you're going to see pleurisy, high risk for pleural effusions, pulmonary hypertension, interstitial lung disease. Gastrointestinal, they may complain of nausea, dyspepsia, or intermittent abdominal pain. Cardiac-wise, they may suffer with pericarditis or myocarditis, um, which leads to vegetation within the pericardial cavity. Hematologic, they may be show as having leukopenia, anemia, or thrombocytopenia, as well as they may also be shown to have alopecia, which is a loss of hair. This slide just shows us the multitude of the most chronic issues that are seen with patients who suffer chronically with lupus. When we're looking for diagnostics and lab tests, there are quite a few that we can run. Um, in the serum, again, you can run an ANA, which will be positive in more than 95% of patients with lupus, but it is not definitive. The anti-SM is a definitive diagnosis testing for lupus patients. It's the anti-Smith test. Anti-DNA will show the disease progression it will be positive most of the time, but not always. White blood cells will show to be elevated because there's inflammatory process. ESR again will be elevated. C3, C4 complements will be decreased. They actually will help play a role in the development of inflammation and they become decreased because they deplete from an inflammatory response. If you're looking at a CBC, it can show anemia, pancytopenia, leukocytosis, thrombocytopenia, and or leukopenia. With renal function tests to determine if there's any kidney complication from SLE, um, you would look at your BUN and creatinine to make a judgment on that. And the urinalysis will often show protein and red blood cells but that only will be seen if there's kidney or renal involvement with the disease progression. Pharmacology. So we want to help manage the inflammatory process and the pain these patients suffer with. We want to reduce their inflammation, um, particularly the arthritic pain that they're going to complain about. Um, but we need to be careful because uh, some of these meds are contraindicated in patients with renal insufficiency, so you'd want to get a baseline for that. So NSAID, you want to be on the lookout for GI bleeding and GI irritation. Salicylates uh, will be given in high doses, so they may be given 325 milligrams four to six times daily. It may be changed to a larger dose that's given less frequently. So again, you're going to look for monitor for bleeding. It will help with the inflammatory process. And usually they'll be on NSAIDs or salicylates. And you want to monitor those levels. Corticosteroids are also a first line defense with the management of lupus. It will help reduce inflammation and will help with the immunosuppression. Side effects can include fluid retention, elevated blood pressure, renal dysfunction insufficiency. You're looking at high blood glucose, increased weight over time, osteoporosis, peptic ulcer disease, psychosis in large long-term doses, and infection. So if a patient's on chronic steroids, 
what happens with infection? Because their immune system is now being suppressed, they're not able to fight off as they would previously. With long-term use of corticosteroids, you need to be aware of moon facies. And when you're monitoring the effectiveness of corticosteroids, you want to focus on your C-reactive proteins. And if you find that they are getting better, it will show the effectiveness for the use of the corticosteroids. The second line defense drugs for lupus are the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Anti-malarials are primarily used to suppress the inflammation of the synovial membranes. Uh, we would give them with NSAIDs. Photosensitivity is a high side effect, so because these patients could be suffering already with it, you want to make sure that you note any changes. And visual changes is the most common side effect of antimalarials. So you want to make sure that you start with a baseline eye exam and then reassess every 6 to 12 months why the patient is actually still on the antimalarials. Immunosuppressants are used to suppress the entire immune system. This actually is the last line of defense after more conservative therapies um, have been tried but has not been successful with, by the patient. These include Rumatrex or Imuran. It causes bone marrow suppression, alopecia, which is already a chronic issue with these patients, increased risk for infection because of its suppressive state in your immune system, and teratogenicity. So we want to think about what happens to the patients in childbearing age, which is your typical uh, diagnostic age for patients. So that means... Uh, So teratogenicity is just the idea of causing congenital malformations. So with immunosuppressants, you also want to keep an eye on your white blood cells because they will be abnormal. When we think about health education and nursing interventions for these patients, you want to make sure that we're keeping your skin safe from further damage by reducing direct sunlight. And if they need to be outside, they should be wearing sunscreen greater than 15 SPF. They should not be out in the heat of the day between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. daily. They need to reapply the sunscreen after activities, swimming, etc. Avoiding harsh shampoos and soaps to prevent further skin damage because of the placking that may occur. Mild protein shampoos are most commonly offered with lupus patients. Steroid creams may be necessary to decrease erythema. We want to protect the inflammatory process in and around joints. Occupational or physical therapy may be needed to further assess and facilitate a healthy, safe discharge once our patients have been managed and monitored adequately. We want to encourage daily activity um, as much as possible. And we want to make sure that we as nurses encourage the patient to continue on their medication regimen as prescribed without going off of it because a lot of the medications need to be tapered down. Some of the medications can have detrimental effects if they're taken off too quickly. They also need to be, the patients also need to be educated on what the signs and symptoms of a flare-up are, including increased fatigue, pain, abdominal discomfort, again that rash, headache, fever, dizziness. They need to report peripheral edema or periorbital edema as these could be linked to more serious complications such as kidney or renal involvement. And we want to offer education on signs and symptoms of infection so that way they can decrease their risk for infection. They need to follow dietary guidelines set up for them as there is a high incidence of cardiovascular damage and elevated blood pressure, so they would probably be on a cardiac controlled diet. And like all immunosuppressed patients, we want to encourage them to receive a yearly flu vaccine 
and pneumococcal vaccines, which are typically given every five years. When focusing on our discharge considerations and our community considerations, we want to make sure we involve the patient and family in their care as much as possible. We need to focus on education topics such as their goals, so we want to decrease flare-ups, the disease process, what it means when it actually gets worse, and when they start to feel better, the importance of their medication regimen, treatment, the multitude of different treatments that will be recommended to them and changes that may need to occur, medication reconciliation through their acute stay in a facility as well as follow up outside, mobility issues and assistive devices, making sure that they have what they need so that they can increase their mobility as much as possible, understanding what flare up signs and symptoms are and how to prevent infection as they are at high risk for infection. And finally, we want to focus on our nursing care outcomes, which include increasing our immune system with consistent care of an immunosuppressive state, inflammation being considered and taken care of, promoting self-worth and motivate for a baseline high quality of life, and to minimize symptoms to make the patient feel as normal as possible. 